Hi, I'm Paul Marcel. Today we'll continue with the Tim Burton table build videos to describe how it went through the no comment number two build. Now today we're going to talk about the legs. Now obviously this is a very leggy table. It's got five legs going off of it and this leg here mirrors this other one on this side. This one mirrors this leg here in the center is unique. Now for the mirroring part it's mostly in the height and the shape, the general shape of the angle. And also in the case of these knuckles down here, they're angled differently for the legs on the left side versus the right side. So, in fact, they are all unique. It's just that these ones here are being mirror imaged on each other. Now, generally, when you're making legs, you're always going to look for rifts on wood. So, what I did is I had taken a large board, a wire board, that had regular flat grain. But if you watch the grain on it, you would see that it actually looped all the way over. So, what I could do is I could rip it into thirds, and then the outside thirds would all be rifts on. So, this is some of the offcut that I have still from that stick. Now the reason you want it to be riff sawn is simply that way you're always going to be presented with straight grain lines on all four sides. Now in this case here we are shaping it and all that but we're still going to end up having predominantly straight grain as opposed to having cathedral grain going everywhere. And also it's more stable this way. Now of course you can always even that middle piece that I have where the grain goes across it horizontally if in a way, if I were to cut a diamond shape out of it, then it would look just like this. It would be riffs on, but smaller. So that other piece is being kept for another table later. Now, one thing I did in the no comment build that might have been hard to figure out what I was doing is I was inspecting all the boards and drawing little circles on them. What I wanted to do was locate all the little pin knots. Now, there are a couple little pin knots on here. There's a very small one here that doesn't really matter much. And then there's a knot here and a small pin knot there. Now on the main boards there were actually quite a few pin knots where you would see the grain lines just coming in really tight around the knot. So you want to avoid those areas if at all possible when you're laying out the legs because they hold a lot of tension. So when you would cut say right next to one of those it's a potential point where say there was a pin knot right here it might actually start to bend the leg a little bit as it settles. So next I laid out the legs. That was what I was doing on all these cardboard sheets. Now where I started with that was I placed the tabletop that I had already roughed out and shaped a little bit. I put that on the ground and then I took a cylinder to suspend the octagon that was already taped together above it at the right height that I wanted. So now the reason I put the tabletop on the bottom is this represents the footprint of the table in the room, how much space it's going to take. And then I took some tape and I put it on the tabletop where I wanted these feet to come down and land. So I wanted to inset those a little bit. Uh, if you have a table, say a regular table where the corner is made out of a 4x4, four four, it seems like I'm always kicking those because it's not recessed in underneath the tabletop. Well, the same thing here. I wanted these legs to be in and that was the easiest way to set a target for it. So with the octagon in place and a known location for where the feet are going to go, then I could easily just take the cardboard and then I could hold it up against the octagon and then just draw a rough line, a rough shape of what I wanted the legs to look like where they were going to land, where it was going to be matched up here, and then work out sort of a, a target for where the knee was going to be located. And then those all got drawn on the assembly table, because once I had those two points, it was very easy to do the rest of the layout. So now you can clearly see from the table that this leg here, the outside legs, were made to be higher than the middle one, than the center one. So we're trying to get a sweep on the front. So besides getting a sweep of where these attachment points are on the octagon, also these knees sweep down a little bit as well. Not quite as pronounced, but they do sweep down. Uh, I wanted to try bringing all of this down more, but I found that the center one to bring it down, it made it look, it made it look too much like somebody kicked the knee and flattened it out a bit. So I did leave it at the same position as these other ones here. But overall the look is there because you see the sweep from here. Now these joints, the angle that they were made at, I mean it depends entirely on what's on this drawing. So I took this drawing, I drew outside lines to say, well, if I had the stock here, the leg would fit inside, I'd be able to cut it out. And then from there, I could measure the angle that was here to know how to make a bisected miter on this corner. So none of these are 45 degree because none of these are 90. So uh, you just had to take that, basically measure it directly off of there using a bevel gauge. Now these joints are all end grain. So it's all end grain to end grain, just like any other miter joint. So the last thing I would want to do is trust this just to glue which is why while the stock was still square, I placed two dominoes into the joint. So you just have to make some good notes to know exactly where they are so you don't expose them later. The reason for putting two in there is because it's going to help resist any twist that might happen. 
Now at this point, a key also was on the end that was gonna attach up here and also on the bottom. I went ahead and I drew a center line on the stock. Now, if you remember the octagon video where I talked about how I placed this into a vise, I'd put the triangle for the octagon on top and then I would domino straight through both pieces. The center line that was on the stock was what was used for placing the domino in the correct orientation. After I shaped some of these legs, it would be very difficult and awkward to just you know, lay it on the table and try to figure out where the horizontal is because none of these sides are dead flat or parallel to what was the outside surface. So it's a lot easier to put those center lines there. Worst case, you don't use it and you glue it up and nobody sees it. Now on the bottom, I did put a center line as well because I wanted to know where to target the foot. After I'd be doing some shaping and stuff, I'd hate for this leg to be scooting over to the sides. Now though I had the drawing of what I wanted the legs to look like, these were just a model. So they were a model for making the blanks. But when I actually went to go make the legs, I mean, they do look different than what I drew here. Now I use Logier rasps for doing all the shaping on the first leg. So the first leg was entirely done with rasps. I really didn't grab any, you know, use the bandsaw or anything like that to help, help out. I wanted to, for one thing, get more comfortable with these rasps, see how fast they can go. And also it was a bit of a discovery of what did I want the legs to actually look like in the final form. So how did I want this knuckle to taper down and then the second knuckle to taper down again down to the foot that we have here on the bottom? And then how did I want the belly part of this over here? From the video, you will have noticed that like the cross section of this over here is wider at the top and then it narrows down. So it's almost like an upside down egg shape that we have back here, but it gives it a really nice feel because of the way that it's, it's got that little belly on the bottom. And that's somewhat the shape that we have over here. These also would have a cross section similar to an upside down egg with the fatter part here near the front. So that was a little bit of discovery. You go back and forth, back and forth with the different rasps until, oh, I'm really liking the look of that. Now, one thing that you can see actually on this outside leg, which will give you an idea of the shape, was when this leg comes down towards the first knuckle, it's angling in towards the knuckle and then it bellies back out and then this angles back in towards the second knuckle and then it bellies out and angles back in to what would be the ankle of the foot. So in all of those cases, I'm trying to add a step without actually making it taper in too, too far. Each time that bellying out brings me back out. And if you look at your own leg or somebody else's legs, if your legs aren't all that hot, uh, that type of shape is reminiscent of regular legs. So obviously maybe that was the whole natural part that made it look really good. So now shaping with a rasp is a lot of fun. Uh, it's relatively quick. You don't get a final surface. I mean, uh, at least when I was using a number 14 rasp at the end, it's certainly not a final finish form for me. If I put a die on there or something like that, it would just be a f kind of a fuzzy mess uh, because of all the torn fiber with a water-based die. And we'll be talking about the finish actually in the next episode. So what I did is I took that first leg, I mirrored it to create this leg here because I had initially made this outside leg here. And then by just drawing it onto the blank, then I was able to take advantage of using the bandsaw. So I used the bandsaw to cut this one here. So once I had this one cut out on the bandsaw, then I was able to kind of move it and scale it to the stock for the other legs. And then I bandsawed those as well. So by bandsawing, I just got rid of a whole ton of rasp work for nothing. And also I used the RAS and the RO90. Now the RAS is the same rotary action sander that I used in the mahogany vanity for shaping and sort of sculpting. This is also the same sander I used for scalloping the bottoms here and shaping the outside edges. So this thing here, when you put a low grit paper on there, is just, it's almost like a grinding wheel that's a little bit more controlled. It's a little bit slower, but you're also not gonna come out looking like Fozzie Bear. So the RAS was really fast at taking off a lot of stock. So if I had to make the curve up here on the inside of the knee and also each one of these bellies here, it was very easy to sort of pre-shape that, get it, get it quite a ways done quickly with the tools and then also to take in these tapers that are on each one of the segments of the leg. Now to continue the shaping, I'd use the RO90 with the interface pad and the soft head on it. So with this, it's very easy to have it conform around some of the shapes while you're doing the sanding. And you get the hang of it pretty quickly. Just keep it in rotary mode so it goes very quickly. And later after I finished the primary shaping, then I would switch this over to some higher grits and then put it in random orbit mode so I could just go and finesse everything around before hitting it with some hand sanding pads. Now I saw a sneak peek of where I did a dry assembly of all this and I put this up on the assembly table and then I used a laser to get a vertical plumb line on the back to mark off where I could lop off the back of the octagon 
as well as where the horizontal line was for cutting the top of this octagon for the table placement. Part of that at the same time while I had the table there is I used some cards as shims. So I just took some playing cards and I tucked them underneath each one of the feet until I got the whole table level. That was how I leveled it in the first place. Now that takes into account any discrepancies in the angles that I had here so that when they attach and they come down, might have missed a little bit. Wouldn't take much of an error in order to lift it up a bit. So with that, I got the whole table level. And then I was able to just take a handful of cards, tape them all up, take an official Frank Klaus's Frank's Cabinet Shop pencil and stick that on top of the cards so that I could run around and mark the entire bottom of the feet. So by doing that, and the assembly table is already dead flat, I was able to draw a pencil line around each foot at a single same plane. So by cutting it off there, of course, now the table would sit flat on the assembly table. So that was how I compensated for the legs being you know, a little bit different. It's so much easier to design a table that way if you just allot for the legs to be at least a half inch longer than you need so that you can put it up on a table like that, tuck in a whole bunch of playing cards, grab a pencil, and mark off where you need to lop it off, and it'll be so much easier to level. Now that actually was used before the feet were completely shaped because I wanted uh, the feet, the little pad that's on the bottom here, there's a chamfered edge that forms the bottom pad. So I wanted that to go about a half inch up from the floor. So by doing that, now I set the, where the floor level was, I could do the chamfered edge, and then I could finish doing the finessing and the shaping down to the bottom. So one of the complications of a table like this where you have five legs, especially that are close together like this, is in a normal demi loon, most of them have three legs. Well, three legs is easy. It's just a tripod. It's always going to sit just fine on the floor. All three feet will touch the floor. So you just got to make sure those three feet are going to hold the table level, and you're done. The problem here is that even after the assembly, the real assembly, where everything got glued and screwed in there, there are some small discrepancies on the feet, like this foot here. This bench here does have a little bit of a dip, but this foot here just skims the surface, doesn't touch the surface. So this leg isn't actually doing anything. Now, if these two legs weren't doing anything, if they weren't touching the ground, and it was these three, we'd be all fine. These could just skim the surface. Not a big deal. But in my case, it's these two that are touching the floor, and this one. So these two both skim the surface. So in this case here, all, I, all I'm going to need to do is now that this has been assembled, uh, I got the primary leveling done. I'm just going to take the RAS with some rough grit or maybe even just the RO90 with a rough grit. And then I'm just going to tap the bottom of the feet that are taller so that I can bring the whole thing down until it sits level. Now, in my case, I'm actually not going to bother doing this because even though there's a small discrepancy here, the floor it's sitting on upstairs is uh, it's one of these ones where they've textured the floor. It's a wood floor with a texture in it. So it turns out that it's not level anyway. And this, where I put it, sits perfect. All legs touch the ground. So I'm actually okay with that. I'm just gonna leave it be. But if I was to install this, say, on a nice flat tile floor, uh, then I would wanna go ahead and just touch the bottoms to make them all perfect. So it's just, a comp it's just something you have to keep in mind if you're doing a table like a demi loon that would have more than three legs. So that's really it for the legs. There's not a lot to them. They take a lot of time, in the case of this table, making the octagon, making the tabletop, doing the stone, all that. That was all really easy compared, time-wise, compared to the legs. The legs just, especially when I was doing the first one with the rasps, although that was actually a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun doing that where you're just doing some shaping, grabbing a stick. Let's see where it goes. So I'd really encourage you to do that. Even if you have a piece of scrap like this left over from a project, toss it in a vise and go. So that's it for the legs. Now we've talked about basically all the other parts, except we haven't talked about the finish. So next episode, we're going to talk about the finish of the legs, uh, the two different finishes that I used on the octagon as well as the tabletop. They are a little bit different for different reasons. And then a little bit for the little mahogany band that we have up top underneath the stone. Might even talk about the stone too, because there is a polish that I put on there that you might want to know about.